Okay. Uh, Director of the Voting and uh, Civic Empowerment Project for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Uh, Kim Belware, a national writer for the Huffington Post. And Kim insisted that she speak first on each one. <laughs> I, could, I spoke beforehand. Kim's really looking forward to this. Okay. Nate King, a field organizer for the International Justice Mission. Good to have you here, Nate. Kelly Chavez, a 2015 graduate of Valparaiso University who is now pursuing graduate studies at the University of Chicago School of Social Services Administration. And at the same time, remaining deeply engaged in a broad range of social and public concerns. Matt Melcherick, Melcherick or Melcherick? Melzarek. Melzarek, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Is that uh, Slovak? Uh, uh, Polish and Czech, yeah. Good, okay, good. Uh, a city commissioner of the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan, who has a history of involvement in community and neighborhood development. And uh, we had a delightful conversation at lunch. He's a young person who's decided to do something about his political commitments, and he's actually serving in a, a political role right now, a governmental role. And Jim Harper, an attorney in private practice here in Valparaiso, who's pursued his interests and commitments in the political ring as well. Okay. So thank you, panelists. Now, I've got three questions I'm going to throw at them. Three questions, okay? And then we're going to open it up uh, to everybody. So everybody ready? All right. Two concepts, two concepts that have long been honored in our civic culture. Citizenship and the idea of the common good. Citizenship and the idea of the common good. Is our collective understanding of these two terms, citizenship and the common good, uh, is it, are they evolving? Is our understanding evolving? And if so, is this evolution in a good direction or a bad direction? Okay. So which direction is, is it evolving and, and what direction is it going to? Ami, let's start with you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We certainly are in a context right now where our thoughts about those concepts are evolving. For me, as someone who has been doing voting rights work for years, but doing immigrants' rights work for longer, the concept of citizenship is a loaded term, and in some ways very helpful and constructive and unifying, and in other ways inherently uh, exclusionary as well, uh, whether we mean the term citizenship literally or not. I still think that it can, that or other words like it can um, evoke an idea of us versus them or, or, or be divisive. And we can also do something with that for the better, as, especially as we also think about an idea of the common good. And I think that, I, I mean, I haven't lost hope even though we are in divisive times and in polarized times. And I, I think that, I think we'll be digging into this a little bit more shortly, but self-interest on the part of voters, on the part of community members, or you know, even people beyond eligible voters, even people beyond those who are technically citizens, it can lead to benefits for our collective interest too, especially when we open up our democracy and our democratic system so that there is fair and open access for people to participate and voice opinions at the polls, which is my special interest in my work, but also just more broadly in, in civic forums. And so th those are a few thoughts I wanted to share. I, I see a lot of opportunities for improvement in, in civic empowerment, civic participation, and improving the common good, but it doesn't have to exist aside from self-interest if we all have a fair shot at giving our voice at the polls and beyond. Matt, citizenship and the common good. Uh, well, I think on the on the long long term, I'm I'm optimistic as I look at you know different generational changes and things I see uh, from younger generations. But if I look at the present day, um, you know it's it's sort of presently evolved in a more negative uh, aspect. Uh, as we've really fought over the years to get to a greater common good, um, some folks have perceived that as them having to lose something for us to, for others to attain, um, you know, the same type of privileges or lifestyle. So that's that's been unique, and I think it'll take us a while to get to a point where people understand that a common good is 
uh, in everyone's benefit and not just them losing benefits as, as others gain them. Uh, on the sort of uh, citizenship civil front, uh, something that really strikes me from the governmental perspective is, uh, and, and Dan, you touched on this, the loss of government being viewed as a, a means of civic engagement and civil improvement. Um, I've, over my career, uh, started more as an activist uh, involved in the community and then obviously worked into uh, the position of an elected official. And it was sort of fascinating to see how um, the public viewed my motives and, and that of others uh, who've had similar paths as going from, you know, a very positive, oh, they're engaged in the community, they're serving on boards, they want to help. And then suddenly when you get involved with government, it's very suspect. You know, what are they, what are they doing? What are they after? It, it, as if somehow people couldn't be in government for those same civic-minded purposes of improving our community. Um, and, and in a way, that's, that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because if that's how you sort of treat the way, you know, people in that uh, field, um, you know, you suspect that they're that way, only people who act that way are maybe gonna go into that field and you'll start to lose those civic-minded folks. Um, I sort of see the same thing with teachers in our society. You know, there's been this very uh, negative cultural shift against teachers, and it's like, well, who would want to go into that field um, if that's the sort of public perception of, of what a teacher is? It's, it's the same thing, I think, with government, whether that be serving as an elected official or actually working uh, as an employee in government. So. That's very good. Kim? I think this one is a, is a difficult one to answer. Something that I'm always paying attention to is, you know, kind of in what context we're understanding how people feel about these things. And I'm a little more hopeful uh, than I think I would be otherwise if I weren't in the habit of going around and talking to people really one-on-one. -on -one. Because if we take um, some of the most common ways that we interact with others and people who aren't like us, you know, maybe a comment section, maybe something we see on social media, a soundbite we see in the news, kind of these, these very high-level, um, edited, superficial responses, they're typically very important emotional and they're often ones that are you know they are selected because they're serving a certain agenda and I think that would indicate a lot of pessimism. It indicates that people are maybe not feeling as open-hearted um, and fluid about concepts of citizenship, concepts of sharing and you know believing in the common good. But when you really start confronting people with questions that, um, not because you're trying to win an argument, but when you're really trying to confront them uh, with you know, the, the logic of what they say they believe, you often reveal it doesn't truly match up, the, the rhetoric doesn't match up with what they really believe and what they really want. Because at the end of the day, everybody really does want clean water and clean air. They do want safety, and they believe in safety for everybody. And, and there's a, a kind of compassion that you can unearth if you are able to get a little deeper beyond some of the rhetoric, and that's what makes me more hopeful. And so I think... Um, some of the uh, the discussions and, and who controls those discussions have been very effective at pulling people in directions that don't quite align with, if they had to live in the world that they're arguing for, they might not actually like it that much. And um, I think you've seen that with uh, you know very specific examples around um, citizenship and, and deporting people maybe who have been here for a long time. People who support that idea stop supporting it when it's their neighbor who they know and who they believe in and who they th believe love this country and contribute well. They liked the idea until the reality of the idea came to their doorstep and then they don't believe it because they believe in this person um, you know, they believe in this person's uh, value and, and how citizenship should be extended to them. So the the idea kind of broke down. And, and the common good, I think, is the same way. You know, we, you know, a lot of people don't like taxes until they, you know, until they benefit from them. And they don't like tax breaks until they get one. And, and so I think um, if we can kind of 
connect is sort of like what Matt was saying. If we can sort of um, root out some of the suspicion that people have about um, community and, and giving in common good, then that really will help people approach it, I think, a little more, feel a little more safe in approaching that. And, and um, it won't feel as risky. I think maybe removing uh, the idea of risk from you know, the common good is, is going to be a big, important step. Really enjoying the conversation already thus far, and I, I would agree that uh, I see a, a, a trend, a change in the way that. Um, I don't think that was me. <laughs> uh, in the way that we. I'm just gonna wait. Uh, a, a change in, a tr in the trend in the way that we are, are thinking um, about the idea of citizenship and the idea of of the common good. And I'd, I'd love to offer a few examples of, uh, in my work as uh, a grassroots organizer for an organization that works on modern day slavery and human trafficking, um, the, the anti-slavery, the anti-trafficking uh, space is one where there's a, there's a good uh, deal of common ground. Uh, and in, in the public domain, it's a, it's a fairly, um, uh, there's, there's some good consensus around the idea that this is something that we'd like to combat in our communities. We'd like to prevent the exploitation of children. We'd like to um, prevent the exploitation of, of labor from people in our community. Um, Sometimes the, the answer of how we, we get to that place, how we get to um, that place of common ground is, is different, but there's an idea of, of consensus around um, seeking that common good, seeking that common ground. And actually, uh, Dr. Anazu cited this example of in Colorado uh, in his presentation this morning, uh, these two groups that uh, coming from different parts of the political spectrum um, and, and different ideas about what the, the common good might be, but are able to have some sort of common ground and work together um, uh, on, a, on a topic. Uh, in, in our field, in the anti-trafficking field, we saw that in the early 2000s with um, the introduction and the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, which is the landmark piece of legislation on the domestic and international side that offers protections and standards for uh, victims of trafficking. And it was a coalition of folks from really both ends of the political spectrum that made something like that possible. So I, I feel uh, fortunate, I guess lucky in some ways, to um, currently be working in an area where there is a, a good deal of, of common ground. We can see that, um, see that happening. To, to comment on the citizenship um, question, I would I feel like I've seen a good deal of um, increased civic engagement uh, in the last few months um, in the in the aftermath of the election um, for for various reasons. But uh, folks are picking up the phone and calling Congress and uh, doing that in in uh, very large numbers. Um, and that's that's I think has to be encouraging, uh, regardless of the kind of the back the um, the backdrop of what's what's driving those calls. There is this sense of uh, as a, as a citizen, I have this power. Um, maybe I should try to wield it um, in some way for some type of common good. So I'm encouraged um, uh, by that piece at this point. Kelly, citizenship and the common good. Sure. Um, I think if you had asked me this um, closer to election, I would have been really pessimistic um, just because it was pretty scary as a person of color to just to see kind of the, the aftermath of that and just thinking of all the rhetoric that we heard leading up to it. Um, but I do I do feel like um, especially communities of color um, really striving to make places um, and and be in places that weren't always um, uh, available to us. Um, and I'm thinking of even when I was still a student here at Valpo, um, all of the different protests and demonstrations that we participated in. Um, the one that I'm most proud of was our um, 
our demonstration against police brutality. Um, and interestingly enough, it wasn't um, created by the black student organization. It was actually the Muslim student organization that approached us um, and said like, hey, like we want to you know, say something about what's going on. And to me, that was so empowering um, and shocking because one, it was like, well, you know, I identify as being part of the African American community. Like, why am I not stepping up and speaking out and doing things to to better the situation? And then, two, like, how amazing is it that someone who doesn't ha hold those identities um, really feels compelled to to do something and to take action? And um, you know, that was just really inspiring to me, um, and it's made me want to help other communities that I don't necessarily identify with, um, but I see that we have a, a common struggle of just wanting to be heard and wanting to live in safety and have just, um, you know, to have equal citizenship, even though, you know, sometimes that may mean that, um, you know, it's a, a tougher fight than maybe we would have anticipated. Um, but I am really inspired just thinking about all the students that I know um, at my school um, in Chicago. There's so many different demonstrations going on all of the time. And it's really empowering to see mass amounts of people, like Nate was saying, just mobilize. Um, people really trying to figure out where they fit into the puzzle, um, because not all of us can you know, run for office. Not all of us can you know, be out in the streets all the time. But there's, a, there's something that all of us can do. And I, I'm starting to see people actually see that there is something possible, like even, even if it is just calling your um, representatives, even if it's, you know, helping out your neighbor like those small acts um, of citizenship really do add up to a lot and um, I am hopeful that this will continue um, as the years go on um, even though we're really in a very um, contentious time I think in our political atmosphere I do find hope that um, the average person is really stepping up and seeing how they can also participate in these systems. I, oh, I'm sorry. I share. I, I'm so excited to talk about this. I, I share that optimism. Um, you know, I think that we are certainly the way that we think about citizenship is changing, no doubt about it. But we're getting. I kind of think of it like we're getting our sea legs a little bit. You know, I mean, we don't live. Um, uh, some of the civic institutions that we've relied on in the past aren't quite as important anymore, right? So not as many people are members of the Rotary Club anymore, right? Not as many people are members of some of these neighborhood and civic organizations that in the past have provided us a way uh, to really engage with our community. Certainly they're still there and they're, they'll, they're still important, uh, but that's changing. Um, and it's understandable that it will take some time to figure out new ways to engage civically um, when we're not relying as much on some of the institutions that we've relied on in the past. But if you want to be optimistic, you know, go to an indivisible meeting, right? Or, you know, even if you don't agree politically, if you want to be optimistic that people um, want to remain engaged with their community, with their elected leaders, you know, go to a community meeting since the election, right? In Valparaiso, Indiana, on the day after the inauguration, there were, what, 500 people marching um, at the local women's march, right? Or close to that, right? There was, um, uh, you know, there was, after the, the travel ban, quote unquote, there was um, an equally large march in Valparaiso, Indiana on that. And I don't mean that to, to say that Valpo is not a progressive community, but you know we're a small community um, that doesn't have a history of progressive activism, right? And notwithstanding that, you saw so many people who weren't engaged before um, figuring out new ways to get engaged. So uh, I think our our ideas of citizenship there are changing, but that leaves me optimistic, right? Um, on a more formal level or, or um, policy level, I think that there are some. Uh, uh, there are some attacks on citizenship that I think we need to be really conscious of um, and how we define citizenship. So, you know, one thing, and I don't know if this is exactly what Ami was pointing to, but when she said it can be a loaded term and it can be a dangerous term, um, I would agree with that in a way because when we start to define citizenship in certain ways, then if you're not, you know, in that category, right, it makes it very easy, easy for us to deprive your rights. So we've seen a lot of laws in the past, you know, five to ten years that disenfranchise people um, directly or indirectly, right? Um, we see a lot of laws that say around the country um, that say to people that if you've been convicted of a crime that you don't 
you, you, you lose your right to vote, right? I mean, that's taking, you know, even though they are still technically citizens, you know, that, that is taking one of the most important rights of citizenship away from them. I'm optimistic, though, because, uh, you know, we see a pushback against that around the country, right? I mean, there, there is a move across the country, um, just to use this one example, to relax felon disenfranchisement laws, right? I mean, the state of Florida next year, there's going to be a referendum on the ballot. You've seen um, uh, uh, legislation in other parts of the country to do that. So, you know, and, and you also see, you know, increased pushback against some of the other disenfranchisement laws that we've seen um, in, in different places, even though that's, that's a very contentious battle right now. All that's to say, you know, I think that, I think we're getting our sea legs, you know, and I think that we're figuring out um, uh, new ways to, to engage in, in, in the importance of some of these rights. And, and um, so that leaves me somewhat hopeful on the common good front, um, or, or our, you know, our notions of common good, I'm also optimistic there, you know. I mean, we are an increasingly diverse society in this country in many ways, right? Ideologically, um, religiously, uh, racially, ethnically, you know, in all different ways. And we're figuring, that's a messy process, you know. I mean, that, that change is not easy, right? And I think that you saw that on full display, um, in in the last election you know there was a lot of there there was some pushback to some of the, some of the changes that people are seeing you know but you know i would agree um i'd agree with with kim that when you have individual conversations with people there's a lot that still unites us right like one of the benefits one of the great things um, that i enjoyed the most about running for office is that you're forced to have conversations one-on-one -on -one with people who disagree with you you know there's not enough of that in all facets of our life so it's nice to do something that that forces you to do that right and i think what you see there is that we there's a lot of things that we agree on you know to to, to use the term that dr lowry um talked about we might not agree some of our normative truths might be different you know, but the underlying facts there, um, the under underlying experiences, you know, we share quite a bit. Um, and I think that, you know, despite some pushback, we're going to become an increasingly tolerant um, society. And so I feel good about that. All right. Uh, second question. And we're going to start with Kim this time. And then we're <laughs> down, down the aisle. And this is where we're really going to test and see how deep your optimism or your pessimism goes. Sorry. We're going we're gonna to really go into the basement right now. Okay. Oh, I, I did want to give you some homework on the first question. So you got you to do this homework. You all have to have a paper on this to Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Now here's your homework. Um, for the next month, anything you're reading or anything you're hearing on the news, if you hear the word citizen, okay, try substituting the word taxpayer or consumer. And if it works equally well, then I would suggest we've lost a certain value in the word citizen, okay? So that's your job. Just insert the word taxpayer or consumer and see if it works equally well and see if we've lost something in terms of the robustness of our understanding of what it means to be a citizen, okay? All right. Um, second question. <laughs> Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has posed two questions in his terrific book, Sources of the Self, The Making of the Modern Identity. Are we living beyond our moral means in continuing allegiance to our standards of justice and benevolence? Do we have ways of seeing good that are still credible to us, which are powerful enough to maintain these standards or to sustain these standards? He anticipated a positive response to the first question. Yes, we are living beyond our moral means. And a negative response to the second question. No, we don't have ways of seeing good which are still credible to us. Reflecting this same view, philosopher Alistair McIntyre has argued that our moral frameworks may now be too weak to support a well-functioning society. We can assert dignity, social justice, and good citizenship as values, but we may be unable to support them with anything but self-referencing uh, self platitudes. Okay, so you got the question? Pretty pessimistic, right? Pretty pessimistic. Are our moral standards sufficient to hold us together? So, I'm going to start. Kim, how do you see this matter? Are we living beyond our moral means? And I'd like to use one of my lifelines. <laughs> is a pluralism based on anything but individual or collective self-interest still possible? What got me thinking about... Maybe doesn't qualify. <laughs> what got me thinking about this in... Um, 
first I wanted to see, you know, instead of giving into the kind of pessimistic framework of this, what is something that I could think of that would refute this? And the first thing I settled on was some of the responses that we saw around the, um, you know, kind of the, the other 99% movement where people were saying, are, you know, one of the things that everybody universally detests is paying taxes. And there was, uh, you know, a movement that we saw of people saying, yes, tax me. I make a lot of money. Maybe I don't make a lot of money, but I believe in what our taxes support. They support health care for the neediest people, libraries, um, public schools, parks, that kind of thing. And so that um, was obviously not everybody who believed that, but there was such a strong groundswell of people who maybe hadn't thought before how much they were, um, you know, how much more they had left to give. And, and if maybe uh, sacrificing a little bit, you know, maybe kind of overdrawing a little bit on that moral bank account, uh, they were willing to do that because they did believe that they were ultimately, um, beyond it being the right thing to do, they were ultimately going to be the beneficiaries if we had um, kind of a more equitable society. And, and that did give me hope because I'm not sure if people would have necessarily thought that way um, a few years, you know, even a few years prior. I think that um, as we see these big divides, you know, what you had mentioned about, you know, people getting uh, more disenfranchised, we see things like income inequality. As more people kind of start falling into, uh, you know, that that sort of danger zone where they might be someone who uh, needs that help, they need that support, they need someone to look out for their rights, everybody becomes a little bit more aware. And then there are people who are safe. I think what's really um, inspiring is the people who are perfectly safe. They see um, what needs to be done in society, even though they will never have to worry, you know, th they will mostly be insulated from the changes, you know, the changing tides. They believe that there is something that we have left to do um, and, and they're willing, whether it comes at great cost to them or a little cost, they, they believe it should be done. So I'm a little more optimistic um, that we are not living beyond our moral means because I think um, it's, uh, you know, it's like a muscle, you know, we're being tested more and we can get stronger. I, I don't think our limit is maybe the bank account was the bad analogy because that's something finite. I think of it more like, you know, um, a living body that can adjust and it can grow and it can grow to meet the current stress put, you know, that's being put on it. So people can grow more flexible, our kind of capacity for, um, you know, a morality can be a little more elastic and a little stronger than it was before because that's maybe just what we need now. Our, our, our society needed it more than it used to. So I think we can, I think we can meet that. And then uh, the second question is, you know, about seeing, uh, you know, it, seeing good, which is still credible to us. Um, I think that, I, th I still think that's gonna hold too because ultimately, um, <coughs> when you think about what everybody is working for, they might be in their own kind of tunnel vision, but they're still working for something that if everybody were able to have a piece of it, they would want it. Everybody is working towards, you know, the life, liberties, pursuit of happiness kind of thing. And those things I think are still universal. It's just the particular path that we take to get there and how easy we want to make that path for everybody that we're in a current disagreement about. I think everybody still agrees in the finish line though. So, so that is what makes me feel, again, more optimistic about that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll tamp that down before we <laughs> Nate, are we living beyond our moral means? Do we have ways of seeing good that are still relevant? No, I, I don't think we're living beyond our moral means. I think uh, I, I have see time and time again, example after example of individuals and groups of people who uh, see a social injustice of some sort and take action uh, to combat that. Um, in, in my work at International Justice Mission, we have teams in 17 different countries across the developing world who are working to combat a specific type of uh, what we call everyday violence against people living in poverty in uh, communities around the developing world. It's really challenging to um, have a kind of um, understanding uh, 
uh, a personal understanding of the magnitude of large social injustices like human trafficking, like modern day slavery. The Global Slavery Index uh, research indicates that there's about 45 million people around the world that live in some type of situation of slavery. And these massive numbers are sometimes hard to uh, uh, stretches the capacity to see uh, a way that we, <laughs> the way that we uh, are not living beyond our moral means, but to see then teams of human beings, people actually working to combat injustice by rescuing people, by bringing people out of situations of, of violence, by uh, restraining criminals who commit these offenses, by restoring individuals who have survived this kind of violent injustice, and then ultimately working to transform the way that justice systems protect their citizens. This is the work that, that IJM does, and this work gives me gives me great hope that we we still have that capacity uh, to to uh, to live within um, our, our moral means. Uh, I'll say as well that um, the work that I do here in in the U.S. seeking to build a movement that takes down this kind of global injustice, uh, there there can be a um, a difficulty in connecting oneself to something that is going on so so far away, so uh, so out of touch uh, with what happens in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, citizen advocacy to our elected officials is just such a powerful way to make that connection. Um, that choices we make uh, to talk to our legislators to tell those in power what we care about and and um, what we see as a moral imperative those things actually have direct impact on the lives of people who are who are suffering today so um, there's there's great need in the world but I also just have great hope that there are people who see that need and are, are responding Ellen? yeah so um as a student, I'm also interning at Feeding America, which is the largest anti-hunger nonprofit in the US. Um, and since the election, the amount of inquiries that we've received from people um, wanting to get involved with our work has just grown exponentially. And it's been really inspiring because it's, it's um, you know, little kids doing their research projects in elementary school asking about how they can get involved. And it's seniors who, in their retirement, want to really get involved with their community communities and you know to me it's it's really amazing to see because I think especially with hunger that's something that we don't always recognize is in all of our communities and um, it's closer to us than we think as individuals um, and so I've been really inspired to see the amount of engagement that people have had um, really wanting to do what's best for their communities um, but then also being really interested in the larger um, anti-hunger movement um, in March, we had our annual um, conference in Washington, D.C., um, and some of the food banks in um, throughout the Feeding America Network brought in some of their clients, um, and that was really empowering because these are people who typically, they're not asked their opinions on things, and they're kind of, um, you know, it's very easy to say, like, well, we serve, like, X number of people, and then we're just going to keep moving on with our business, but, um, you know, these food banks made a conscious effort to include the people that are um, in most need and are most vulnerable and give them the opportunity to speak on their own behalf. And some of them went to their Congress people and were saying how important it is to save our federal nutrition um, safety net. And, you know, I, I think that it's, it's something that people, people want to be involved. I think it's just a matter of those of us who are, who have the opportunity to already speak out to elevate the voices of others. Um, you know, the food banks could have easily just sent their staff and said, this is, these are our talking points and this is what we're gonna do. Um, but they brought people who had these lived experiences and I think, you know, it's a responsibility of us um, in whatever um, power and privilege capacity that we do have to recognize um, the other people, especially if you're going into uh, a service field and are wanting to create change in your community, to think about what that means um, beyond just the work that you're doing, but the people that you're ultimately wanting to serve, and making sure that their voices are um, even beyond ours in a lot of ways. Because you know, as a, a social work student, I can study about policies and I can study about trends and things like that, but I won't really know what it's like to actually 
live with hunger unless I've actually lived with hunger. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that, I think that's a resource that we're starting to tap into. I think it's a, a, a resource that has such great potential to really um, bring light to a lot of issues um, that we are facing. It's just a matter of us being willing to, to give that space and to allow people to speak um, on behalf of themselves. Yeah, I don't think we are either. I mean, I, I share a lot of this optimism. Um, and you know, you're gonna, we're, we're doing our best here to push back on this. So, um, talking you off the ledge. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's us and Andrew Jackson today. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, like a nice the, kind of one of the ways that I think about it is that you've had all this. Not to keep talking about it, but we've had this all this activism since the election, right? And you know, you've got marches and all all that jazz and in Valpo and across the country. And so I think of it like, are the people who are out there, are they marching because they want the selfie or are they marching because they see themselves in others, right? They understand the experiences or, or are trying to understand the experiences that other people are, are, are going through. Um, they see that they could be in that position or they see that their child could be in that position um, and they've decided that, that they need to push back. Now, I am not above a good selfie, but I think that most people are in it because they genuinely want to help um, the situation and that they can see themselves or their child um, in the si situation that they're, that they're fighting against. Um, that makes me think that we're not living beyond our moral means. I mean, it's a tough question for me, but that's something that gives me uh, quite a bit of um, uh, quite a bit of confidence. The other thing is, you know, we talked, or, um, one of the other panelists talked a little bit about, you know, the example of people kind of pushing back against deportation when they see it in their community, you know? I mean, during the um, uh, election, um, you know, there was, there was a debate about deportation, right? And one of the, and not to get too political, but you know, one of the candidates, um, uh, you know, the president was campaigning on on increasing deportation. You have a lot of people. I mean, stories. I feel like I read one of these stories every week, right? About people who um, uh, supported the president and have people in their community who were um, who were being deported or threatened with deportation, right? And they feel differently about it. And what that tells me, it doesn't tell me that that you know, there's something wrong necessarily with those people's values. Um, I think it tells me there are some structural issues we have to deal with, right? It tells me that they're probably, um, I, frankly, it raises some media issues for me, right? Like they're probably not getting complete information from the media that they choose to, to consume. You know, our media has become really fragmented right now, so it's really easy to just kind of plug into a certain viewpoint. And with that viewpoint comes, not just a viewpoint, but often different facts, right? And so, but, when they're confronted with something that's in their face in their community and they, they can't avoid it, um, you know, they a lot of times people have a different take, right? Um, so when they're confronted with more facts, um, or when they're forced to, to recognize them, you know, I think that that they have a different. You, you've seen a lot of examples of people taking a different position. That makes me optimistic. Um, makes me think that um, you know our values are truly held in many cases. So I'll provide a little bit of a different perspective. My answer in my heart is still up in the air. So I'll tell you how I sometimes get through the day or get through my work and, and really enjoy my work is to sometimes think that I'm not sure if it matters. And I still have a lot of constructive work that I can do in partnership with communities regardless of what the answer to that is. And the reason that a lot of times I approach my day like that is because I've, I see a lot of situations where self-interest and holding our elected leaders and government leaders and candidates accountable can lead to common good and even pluralistic type outcomes, especially if there is equitable access to the voting system in particular. And I want to talk a little bit about an aspect of the voting system that may seem boring, but that really does lead to uh, fairness in this realm leads to many of the outcomes that we're talking about that we're all hoping for. And that is access to voter registration itself. So one of my main areas of work is to lead statewide nonpartisan voter protection efforts in Illinois in major elections, not just presidential elections, but our local municipal elections as well. Incidentally, we ac actually also take a lot of calls from Indiana voters, which is important to me and sometimes the best part of my work. I'm born and raised in Indiana and um, the work is that work is close to my heart. And 
I wanted to read to you parts of a letter that's um, not even hot, hot off the presses because it's not on the presses yet. It's, it was just formulated by one of my young colleagues, actually. He's a first-year attorney. His name is Ryan Cortazar, and um, he, he shared this with me yesterday. While I was in law school, I saw voting access as a problem limited to some former Jim Crow states and others that followed their lead. But after joining Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, I have seen firsthand the barriers that black and brown communities in Chicago too often encounter when trying to cast their ballots. These obstacles come in two varieties. Obvious problems like language barriers, voter intimidation, missing ballots and long lines at the voting booth often occur in spite of voting rights laws. Though troubling, these problems can be fixed by civil rights advocates and government administrators working together to enforce the law. Another type of barrier related to voter registration is subtler but in some ways more insidious because it's enshrined in our law. In the 19th century, states like Illinois changed the then existing law to burden voters rather than the government with complex registration requirements in efforts to disenfranchise freed slaves and ethnic European immigrants. The discrimination planted in these laws continue to, continues to bear fruit, making it difficult for people of color to vote today. Um, he, Ryan goes on to talk about a legislative proposal we have up in Illinois right now that's actually supported by Democrats and Republicans in our state that would make automatic voter registration part of our law so that community members who are eligible voters whose information is in already in state agency databases would get to be automatically added to the voter rolls unless they wanted to opt out, which of course they would have the chance to do that if they wanted to. Um, Ryan also writes, national research shows that Latino and black voters move significantly more often than whites, putting their registration status continuously in peril under the current system. Blacks and Latinos are also much likely to have driver's licenses and state IDs than whites, making traditional motor voter protections less effective. With race disparity and voter registration hovering at 50% higher in Illinois than nationwide, measures like automatic voter registration would be a huge step in fulfilling the ideals of our democracy and guaranteeing the right of each eligible voter to make their voice heard. And so I, I just, I wanted to share that thought with you that if we open up the system, there can be uh, avenues to pluralistic outcomes and outcomes benefiting the common good, um, even if it's not always coming as a, a moral agreement or, or consensus, but by opening up our system to more participants, we can reach some of those same outcomes. Man, are we living beyond our moral means? <laughs> Uh, you ready for a pessimistic approach? <laughs> I don't have it to offer. Uh, I've, I've got more optimism. Um, I don't believe we're living uh, beyond our moral means, but I think that the, the pace at which we are evolving those is maybe beyond our moral means. And, and our, our ability to evolve how we understand our moral uh, compasses uh, as a society um, we're just trying to figure it out you know as we talked about this morning there used to be this Protestant sort of core value that, that held us all together and I think many people today have based where we view our morals at off of that but they don't hold on to that as the is the reason um, you know, I, I live in a very progressive community that has many faiths and, and also many people who are not of, of a certain religion, but they have core values that are the same. And what I think we need to figure out as a society, and we'll get there, is how do we validate that moral compass without the use of faith alone you know it, it's not just faiths talking but it's people of non-faiths or radically different faiths um and we're we're still trying to figure out how to have that conversation in a civil way to where there's empathy and understanding um so we're sort of in the middle portion right now where there's a lot of room for pessimism but i think in the long haul uh i've got a lot of optimism we'll get there and the reason is uh, you know the the second part of the question asks about you know, a well-functioning society. And I think ultimately a well-functioning society is something that humans as a whole want. They see a benefit in it. 
um, to themselves and to others. And how you have that well-functioning society is with a general set of moral beliefs. Um, and where we're struggling now is how do we get to those moral beliefs? We know how we got to them in the past. Uh, and there's sort of a lot of conflicts on how we get there in the future. I think we'll get there um, because I don't think it's beyond you know, our capacity as humans to live up to our moral means. Um, it's just uh, a bit of a challenge to get there, I think. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's your homework, okay? All right, here's your homework. Take any public policy issue. Sometimes, again, you have to have your paper into Elizabeth within two weeks, or <laughs> Take any public policy issue that you see in the newspaper right now. It could be one of the issues that was raised here, several really good ones, or it could be the execution we just witnessed in Arkansas two days ago, or DACA, what's being done with DACA, tax reform or health care reform. Take any one of those issues. And if you think of social justice, one definition of social justice is it's how we divvy up life's benefits and its burdens. That's what social justice is. It's how we choose to divvy up life's benefits and its burdens. See if you can articulate what the underlying principle is for whatever settlement occurred on that public policy issue, whatever was done. And here's what's available to you. Here's what's available to you. Utilitarianism, we do a lot of utilitarian thinking in our culture. Libertarianism, that's become increasingly important in the decisions that we make. Contract theory, contract theory, who's a citizen, who's not a citizen, think John Rawls for those of you familiar with his work. Political, it's just pure, sheer political power for self-interest. Pragmatism, we'll muddle through as best we can, or that idea of transcendent belief, faith. Okay, see if you can articulate which one of them is really the basis for making that decision. Utilitarianism, libertarianism, contract theory, uh, political uh, pragmatism, or that transcendent faith. Once you identify, ask yourself, is that gonna sustain us in the long term? Once you've identified what that underlying basis for decision is, say, is that really gonna serve us well in the long term? Okay, great. You know, I did have a third question, but I think what I'm gonna do is go to you guys because we're otherwise gonna run out of time. I'll tell you what the question was and then you can reflect on it, okay? The question is, because it really deals with universities and the role of universities. Professionals, most of whom have been trained in universities, tend to be enmeshed in the traditions, values, and methods of their professions. In many ways, they are formed in the values and in the ways of thinking of their professions, to the professions to which they devote their lives. Professionals tend to be deeply embedded in institutions as well. Have we done enough as universities to help young professionals appreciate the disadvantages as well as the advantages of their professional and institutional acculturation and allegiances? Have we done enough to help them transcend their professional identities when needed so that the voices of others can be heard? Okay, so you can think about that, no paper required. Okay. Let's see if we have questions out there for our panelists who've really done a terrific job. Yes? So I have a question that probably doesn't require a lot more articulating than what you've done already on this, but I do have I don't know, I'm challenging what you guys are all saying about how optimistic you are a little bit. So you all, mostly all talked about optimism and stories of hope, but I have to think that there are everyday failures, shortcomings, and even larger step backs where you think that you're going forward and you've made a good change, and then you're 10 steps back, you know, a year or two or 10 later. So what is it that really motivates you to continue what you're doing? Is it little victories? Is it the spirit of optimism and hope that you all talked about? Is it none of it? Is it all of it? Like, just I would like a little bit more articulation on what keeps you motivated because there is a lot of negative and a lot of pessimism. I think to be to be there. Matt, you have something? Thank you. Um, well, I guess I'd I'd add in. You know, my optimism is long term, and I have a lot of short term pessimism. Uh, really an abundance of it. Um, so just, I really just, like Matt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think what gives me optimism is is those small victories and I guess just looking at younger generations and the generational divide. Um, you know, pick your issue and I think 
whether people disagree on something, I think how they disagree in the younger generations is a healthier way to disagree. Um, and I, I just have a lot of hope that, that as time moves on and you know just the nature of time and who is in power changes that we will have the systems change we need because younger generations have you know we're, we're now i guess my generation is the first generation you know makes less than its parents is not better off than their parents generation and we're we're not quite in power to do anything about that yet but eventually just the nature of time we will be and i'm i'm optimistic about that because we we're currently pessimistic enough to see all the problems that someday we will hopefully do something about it. I, I want to chime in too. So when there are failures or when there are shortcomings that happen, that can be a good inspiration for change too. So I think uh, probably I speak for all of us here to say we definitely don't have it all figured out prospectively all the time or maybe any of the time. <laughs> and so sometimes it's through those failures or those challenges and especially when we or when I as an advocate can we can put our heads together with community members who are most directly affected as Kelly and others reference. I think that's where a lot of the forward movement can come but sometimes we as advocates as attorneys we're not really pushed to devote time and resources to that probably better way of doing work unless we're not doing well at our work in the first place and so that and this relates to a question you had asked earlier too about working among different types of professionals or people with different um, titles or or professional attributions or amounts of privilege and I think that that kind of collaboration is really important there might be different incentives that lead us to that type of collaboration at different times but the more that we can take that on when uh, I mean we heard stories from community groups about appalling voter intimidation at the polls that happened one of the years we had a voter protection program in place and it was not until over one year later that I even heard that there was such an instance where uniformed police officers were standing outside of the poll in this um, Illinois suburban area asking voters as they were coming in for ID which is not required at the polls in Illinois and asking people who they plan to vote for and, and intimidating voters I didn't know about it till much later is my work even relevant if I don't know about such a thing or, or stop it or address it and but it's through that kind of failure that we we saw it as a failure of ours that came some better strategies to work cl more closely with community groups the next time around, including people who are not from a legal background or you know who spend their time very differently than I might. And it's also about putting my own privilege in check throughout that process. So I have had the opportunities I have, and I do the work I do, be, uh, you know, largely because of the privilege that I have in life and because of sacrifices of my family and my community. And I wanted to mention that my dad joined me here today, and I don't know if I'm the only person to bring my fa father to a, a talk called Not Your Parents Politics. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to mention that for me, it's a, lot, it's, <laughs> it's a lot about the examination of privilege, too. And that's something that you can't, we, we can't, or I can't just do it once and think I have it figured out. It just is an ongoing process. Jim, you were going to say something? I mean, the only thing I wanted to add is that it's not it's not supposed to be an easy thing, right? I mean, you know, it's not it's it's always going to be um, when you're you know figuring out your career path, what your passion is, and what you want to devote your energy to. That's not an easy. That's going to be a struggle, you know. And so I think that we need to accept that a little bit, right? Like, and not that I'm not pretending to be an expert on it, but I I go through career struggles all the time. I mean, it's a it's a real battle, right? Uh, as to as to where I can you know spend my energy the best what i would say is i think you know and i think this is in agreement but for me small victories are such are, are sustaining right like you know as a um uh one of my past jobs was i was a public defender right and there's something about you know representing a person having those hard conversations with them being the only person that's ever fought for them before because they just they've they haven't had anybody to fight for them before, win or lose, that's really empowering, right? Um, there's something about, you know, politically, right? Like, 
knocking on somebody's door after 20 people have been rude to you and told you that they have no interest in talking to you that day and knocking on somebody's door and them inviting you into their their living room or their their kitchen and talking about the experiences that they've had right like and you being able because of that to get a better understanding of what they and their neighbors are going through and then maybe having a better understanding of your perspective like you know those small things i think are sustaining and i think that we all need to really um try and um uh, appreciate them one other thought uh, ami was going in this direction i think a little bit earlier uh to the, in the answer to the second question that uh, sometimes you can't measure results you know one of the advantage of that transcendent perspective or that religious perspective is that you do it because it's the right thing to do irrespective of the outcomes um, from a christian perspective we think of it as the life of discipleship as uh, daniel berrigan once very famously said if you want to be a christian you better consider first how you're going to look on wood you know it's, the outcomes don't matter you do it because it's the right thing to do which is one of the great advantage of having that broader perspective we have five minutes and time for one more question and this can go more broadly to the whole panel, but first I'd like to bring it up to, to Nate, to your point. You brought up an interesting statistic that's more global, I would say, right? In terms of, of what was it, 45 million? Yeah. And your work, uh, although it be more domestic in terms of who you work with, the impact of your organization is more global. Would you agree? Yeah, that's right. And so my, my question would be, uh, do our small efforts um, of justice or of, of uplifting outweigh this sort of massive failure in moral behavior um, brought about by the statistic that you mentioned. Um, and I think that, that I could bring that to all of the panel, but start specifically with you. Mike. Sure. So there's a, uh, I think there's a sense of for whatever, and you know, we, as we've just been discussing here, whatever. Um, social problems, social in injustice that we're, we're talking about, that we're addressing, there's a, a road that led us to this current place that we're in, right? Um, so in any um, way of engaging with that issue, I think there's some type of journey that has to happen that you arrive to a place of how did we get here? What, what factors have caused us to be, um, uh, to be in this current, in this place? Uh, f for me, and uh, in, in the world of in the anti-trafficking world, for uh, for me, I, I lived in that space for a number of years, kind of thinking about these questions of how did this how did this problem become such a a massive uh, injustice, so such a huge um, issue, and now I don't think about that as much anymore. I think a lot about. Um, ways that we are uh, addressing it ways that we are combating it i don't i don't think that's necessarily 100 percent positive though it, you know it's kind of both ends of the of the spectrum maybe um so being able to work um in in a in a space that you are are seeking after um uh, a common good and, and working for a a social cause being able to have some grounding in how we arrived in this location um but then also just uh, being really intentional about taking the uh, taking heart in what we are seeing as as success. So the 45 million number. Sometimes what I sh sometimes I share that number. Sometimes I don't share that number because it's it can be paralyzing. It can be uh, uh, move, move, moves you to a place that you're, you're just immobile. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I share numbers as well that IJM has existed for about 20 years now. And um, in the course of our work in a particular location um, in Cebu, in the Philippines, over uh, a seven year period, IJM saw the reduction of minors who are available for commercial sex by 79%. So that's a massive number too. Um, so there's, there's a, I think a grounding in that kind of data, both positive and, and negative, that that drives me forward. That keeps me um, focused on the task at hand, but also uh, realizing that there, there can be success too. The challenge is then when you, when you don't have those, those numbers of success, how do you maintain uh, that hope and that faith? And I think uh, there's a, for me, there's a real sense of, um, 
uh, as, a, as a Christian, there's a, a sense of duty and calling there, but there's even just a, a, a more broad sense of this is meaningful work that, sh- that should be done. Someone needs to do it. So, yeah, I'm just going to do it. And I think we're going to have to leave it at that. I think the panel did a terrific job. Nice job. <laughs>